assalamu alaikum and good evening well i would like to welcome you all to our uh, 19th shokat khanam cancer symposium and this is our gynae oncology session i know after this very long day you all be very tired but we all know that the show stoppers usually come at night or they are the last ones to be there in the uh, program so that is why gynae oncology was given the last session of the day so that we can continue as much time as we can so i'm very thankful to my speakers who have uh, accepted the invitation in these hard times of pandemic and these trump elections where everything is undecisive in the world they have taken out their time and accepted our invitation to join our program and to be part of this learning activity we have two talks lined up for next 90 minutes first of all i would like to uh, invite dr mansoor raza mirza uh, he is presently chief oncologist of, at department of oncology at copenhagen university hospital and i'm sure whoever does gynae oncology is well aware of dr mansoor because he had made highlights this entire year through his uh, ground breaking research in ovarian cancers thank you very much dr mansoor for accepting our invitation and uh, i would like dr mansoor to please uh, start is because he has some time constraints so i would without wasting any time i would like dr mansoor to uh, start his presentation thank you dr sabinda uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, again to this uh, very uh, important uh, symposium for for pakistan and um, it's a pity that we cannot be together but uh, but it is possible to do it virtually um uh, the today topic of my talk Uh, which I was asked to do is uh, PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer, uh, setting new standard of care. Um, I work as a clinical oncologist in Copenhagen in Riks Hospital, and I'm medical director of Nordic Society of Gynecologic Oncology. I'm also chairing the European network of gynecologic oncology trials group. Um, these are my disclosures. I, I I think I will start with this slide. which is not very uh, uh very optimistic but this is how it was until uh, recently uh, sorry for interruption dr mansur your screen is not shared we can't see your screen can you see it now yes we can yeah it's okay perfect okay thank you very much sorry for uh, this uh miss okay so so these are my disclosures and um Uh, until now it was that if you had uh, diagnosed a patient with advanced stage disease with ovarian cancer stage 3c and 4 uh, uh, at 5 years only 20% of these patients were alive uh, which is quite pathetic and that has been changed uh, recently and I'll go through that so what we have been doing is uh, after diagnosis patients received either uh, chemotherapy as new adjuvant or uh um uh, surgery up front uh, and 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 or interval debulking surgery and chemotherapy later and rate of response uh, on chemotherapy was quite is quite high above 75% uh, but second assessment operations found disease in almost half of the patients who were otherwise uh, had complete remission and even the patients who had pathological complete remission uh, more than 40% of these patients will relapse uh, within 2 years so that's quite pathetic and something has to be done uh, and that's why the idea of maintenance therapy uh, started uh, uh, considering uh, working uh, started to be our uh, topic so so we have been for last 20 years uh, working to improve the outcome of the patients delay the prog progression the subsequent progression by prolonging initial therapy by high dose chemotherapy intraperitoneal chemotherapy immunotherapy all trials were negative uh, the paclitaxel trial of one one year of maintenance paclitaxel was positive for progression free survival but it was too toxic uh, um, and 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 at the end uh, we had two trials uh, which were positive for uh, bevacizumab which gave labeled to bevacizumab uh, as treatment these are the two trials GOG218 and ICAN7 they were published in 2011 uh, and this showed that progression free survival was improved there was no overall survival benefit and it's difficult to get overall survival benefit uh, in the uh, patient setting where you have multiple uh, treatments past progression and you uh, improve uh, uh, progression free survival on each Uh, um, uh, treatment. 
Um, so, so that was the reason that why we have bevacizumab up front uh, today. Uh, since then, we have now enough trials coming up in first line for PARP inhibitors, uh, and we will uh, now move over to PARP inhibitors and discuss the first line. Before discuss, uh, so here you can see that PARP inhibitors are now approved by European Medicines Agency and FDA, uh, both in first line maintenance therapy as a platinum sensitive relapse in maintenance therapy and in multiple relapses as treatment setting. Uh, <clears throat> how PARPs, PARP inhibitors work? If you look at the homologous recombination defects in high grade serious ovarian cancer, uh, one fourth of these patients are, are, are uh, uh, BRCA mute, uh, and another one fourth of the patients have some uh, chromosomal damage, a similar biology, uh, 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 similar uh, pathology, which makes them uh, behave like BRCA mute. So we call them BRCA ness, or, or uh, uh, in common sense, half of these patients will have. Uh, deficiency of homologous recombination. I'll come back to that. And the other, the other half has uh, 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 homologous recombination uh, proficient disease. So what? why we need that? Because if we look how PARP works, uh, all the time uh, DNA has single strand breaks and these uh, st single strand breaks can be uh, repaired best uh, with PARP enzyme. And if you block PARP enzyme, uh, you will not let uh, SSB is to be repaired. Uh, these cells will divide and have, you will see then double strand breaks as the DNA will replicate. And these DNA double strand breaks can also be repaired. The best repair mechanism is uh, placed on the BRCA genes, uh, which is called homologous recombination repair. Uh, and if uh, any normal cells, it will continue to repair, but in the BRCA mute population or BRCA nest population, that function is not uh, uh, in order. And that means that by blocking PARP enzyme, uh, by PARP inhibitor, you will uh, stop uh, repair of double strand break at the end, um, and that will bring cell to programmed cell death. This is the simplest way to uh, understand, but I will show you that this is, it's not only the uh, HR uh, um, deficiency which matters, you also have efficacy of PARP inhibitors in all populations, regardless of HR deficiency. PARPs are not just PARP, uh, they're different. The, one of the most important uh, uh, factor regarding potency of PARP is uh, trapping mechanism. And as you can see, telazaparib is probably the strongest trapper and neraparib. And olaparib, rucaparib, and viliparib are weaker trappers. So there are differences uh, in, in trapping. That means uh, that you have uh, probably more uh, efficacy of, of, uh, of uh, the first two drugs uh, in, in, the, uh, in the cells. Another important thing is pharmacodynamics, volume of distribution, bioavailability uh, is highest uh, uh, of neraparib compared with elaparib and rucaparib, again, telling us that you have more drug available intracellular. That may not be uh, necessary uh, to have for the BRCA mute cells because they are extremely sensitive to PARP inhibitors. Uh, but when it comes to BRCA wild type, you probably need a higher uh, concentrations. And that could be one of the reasons why you see more efficacy of neraparib as compared to other PARP inhibitors in uh, also in BRCA wild type population. And I'll come back to that as well. And you can see here uh, uh, in the BRCA wild type disease, if you divide the patients, half of these patients would be HR deficient, other HR proficient. Uh, and in these xenograph models, you can see there is a suppression of uh, tumor activity, both uh, in HR deficient and proficient disease, when neuraparib is getting a better uh, tumor uh, suppression than, than the, than the uh, olaparib. Uh, uh, another uh, preclinical data coming out, pharmacodynamics, showing that tumor concentration is higher uh, intracellular uh, uh, in, in, uh, with the raparib than in elaparib. And there is a uh, more concentration of uh, neuraparib in, uh, brain, uh, uh, in the brain. So there is a better transfer to blood-brain barrier. 
tells that parps are different and, and, and you have different uh, sorts of toxicities uh, and uh, sorts of efficacy of the parps. Now we go to the clinical data. We have four phase three trials in first line, which were presented in 2018 and 19. Solo one is the trial which was done only in BRCA mute population. These are all almost all maintenance trials. I will come to Velia in a moment. Uh, so Katie Moore presented it in um, uh, in, uh, in 2008. So where did you yep. stop seeing my slides? Yep. So, so we, were, we were at this slide only. We... Okay, then we can, yep. sorry for that. Uh, no, you can no. hear me and you can see my slides now. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll hope that this will continue like that. So so the, the, the Paula 1 trial uh, was uh, actually not part uh, versus placebo, it's PARP, uh, Alapri plus Bevacizumab versus placebo plus Bevacizumab, and Alapri is given for two years. Uh, then comes the PRIMA trial. PRIMA trial is a pure uh, PARP trial, and this is the high-risk population, and I'll come back to the population in a moment. Uh, the patients who had responded to chemotherapy, they were randomized to receive three years of neuroparib or placebo uh, in, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, all, for all these trials, primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Veliparib is a drug which can be combined with chemotherapy with not much excessive toxicity. So this trial was performed in the same design as GOG218. So patients had uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, plus placebo, filiparib, concomitant, and, uh, and maintenance in uh, uh, standard of care arm, uh, concomitant alone in arm two, and concomitant and maintenance in both in, uh, in the arm three. Uh, the, I will not discuss Velia trial because that was pos pos positive only in BRCA mute population, and the company has decided not to go ahead with any uh, further activity in ovarian cancer. So we will not see viliparib in ovarian cancer due to lesser activity, I would say, although you cannot compare them into each other, but they could not show activity beyond uh, BRCA mute population. So if you look at the population of these, and I have added uh, the, the, the Bevacizumab trials in this uh, chart as well, uh, uh, you can see that uh, patients who must have had residual disease to enter in PRIMA trial, neuroparib trial, uh, and in uh, GOG218, but others could have had no residual disease. So that makes uh, the PRIMA and GOG more high-risk population. Again, stage four disease was not allowed uh, in GOG218, and new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy was not allowed in GOG218 and ICAN7. That makes the PARP trials more high-risk population. And as I said, solo one was performed only in BRCA mute population. So what are the results? If you look at the whole population, I left solo one alone because that's only in BRCA mute population. So you look at the Paula one and Prima in whole population, the results uh, the, the, uh, met their criteria and they were positive uh, both for uh, in Paula one and, and in Prima. When we divide them according to the uh, the, the status of their uh, BRCA and HRD, and look at the BRCA mute population. Here you have three trials showing us the results, the SOLO1, Paula1, one, and PRIMA. All three trials are extremely positive. You can see uh, the most important thing is this is long-term efficacy. You stop the treatment at two or three years. You don't see Kaplan markers falling into each other. Uh, and they are plateauing. So probably we are even curing some of these patients that they may not even uh, uh, relapse uh, after receiving two years or three years of PARP inhibitors. So this is very comforting uh, to see these very positive uh, efficacy. When it comes to the BRCA wild type population, we can divide it, as I said, into HR deficient population, which should behave like uh, BRCA mute and HR proficient population. So in HR deficient population, again, you see both Paula and Prima showing uh, very nice activity. Paula one in with Olapri plus Bevacizumab and Prima with Nerapri alone. So again, you have two options available here as well uh, for, for, for these patients. However, when it comes to the HR proficient disease, uh, uh, you see efficacy of only Nerapri uh, or uh, the uh, olaparib and bevacizumab in Paola was negative. Uh, and this uh, uh, 
this is a moderate activity, but it is uh, clinically and statistically uh, significant. And you see that these four, uh, curves again do not fall into each other and one fifth of the patients are relapse free by, uh, and by the data cutoff time. And this all means that we will, it will take much more time to see the overall survival benefit in these. So if I put the hazard ratios together, again, I said it is not to compare the trials, it is just to give an idea that in Nirapari uh, trial, the PRIMA trial, you see efficacy in whole population, regardless of BRCA mutation, regardless of uh, uh, HRD mutation uh, uh, status. Solo one was done only in BRCA mute population and Paula one, uh, the Lapri plus bevacizumab is positive both in BRCA mute and in BRCA wild type, however, in the, the HR deficient population only. So you have a possibility here uh, 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 to pre treat these patients either with PARP alone or with the combination of PARP plus uh, bevacizumab. When it comes to BRCA wild type HR proficient disease, and the efficacy of neraparib is somewhat similar as in bevacizumab in 218. So question is what you want to choose. Uh, uh, we know that bevacizumab is effective both in first line and in platinum sensitive and in platinum uh, resistant disease. Uh, however, we, PAPs have shown that they have a highest efficacy upfront. Uh, the efficacy is lesser and lesser if you go to multiple lines of treatment. That's why my choice would be to start with PARP inhibitor to get most ef efficacy of that and save uh, bevacizumab for the relapse setting. When we look at the toxicity, I think most important is these are the drugs given daily, that how many patients discontinue the treatment uh, uh, due to toxicity. And you can see the number of patients discontinuing is quite Quite, less, uh, quite a few from 10 to 20%, and, uh, and that is quite comforting again. Uh, so uh, EMA and uh, FDA has already approved, uh, uh, due to these three trials, Nirapri alone or Alapri alone or Alapri plus Bevacizumab uh, for the patients who are BRCA mute. When it comes to the BRCA wild type, but HRD, uh, HR deficient disease, uh, the uh, uh, Nerapri alone or Alapri plus Bevacizumab is approved. And when it comes to the whole population, Nerapri is approved. So you have now uh, availability uh, to, to see uh, uh, that you have options available and we can take a discussion at the end. What are you going to choose? Now let's go to the platinum sensitive relapse. Here, uh, if you look at the Bevacizumab, we have three randomized trials available, Oceans, GOG213, and METO16. Uh, all three trials showed PFS benefit, GOG213 has shown uh, almost survival benefit as well. That means that you have availability of bevacizumab in this population. When it uh, and on, on top of that, uh, the pay, the METO 16 trial was uh, designed to uh, answer the question of bev after bev. So all these patients had uh, bev earlier, received earlier, and had, had progressed. And still, this you see a hazard ratio of 0.51. Uh, when we come to the platinum resistant disease. Here again, uh, in the monotherapy, uh, monochemotherapy plus bevacizumab, the Aurelia trial showed a clear benefit of PFS uh, and symptom control. Uh, it did not show overall survival benefit because there was uh, uh, inbuilt one-sided crossover. So the patients with chemo alone were offered to receive uh, bevacizumab later. So that tells us that, as I said, bevacizumab is effective in all three settings and can be, uh, can be given. Let's move to PARP and platinum sensitive. The first trial which was presented, which showed uh, clear benefit was by Jonathan Letterman in uh, study 19 uh, in 2012. Uh, in whole population uh, who were platinum sensitive, they received chemotherapy and once they were in response, uh, they, they were uh, treated with either laparib or placebo until progression of disease. After receiving such a, a huge benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.35, Jonathan went back and took uh, 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 consent from patients to do the BRCA status. And after two years, he presented the, the two retrospective cohorts, one in BRCA mute population and one in BRCA wild type. Both were positive uh, uh, in BRCA mute. 
uh, hazard ratio was 0.18, which gave uh, us in Europe approval so we could use already from then uh, bevacizumab uh, as treatment as a maintenance treatment uh, in BRCA mute population. Uh, the, the, that was a retrospective analysis of a phase two trial and AstraZeneca had to perform uh, a confirmatory study that was performed, that was solo two, it was performed only in BRCA mute population, uh, showing again a tremendous benefit uh, of alaparib uh, given um, as a maintenance therapy until progression of disease. And now this year we saw also the overall survival data of, uh, of SOLO2, uh, which uh, shows borderline uh, uh, significance, but, but we will not see these uh, benefit in overall survival anymore because PARP is uh, available as standard of care. So all these, most of these patients get unblinded after progression. And if they have received placebo, they are crossed over by physicians to receive active part therapy. Yes, uh, short. Sorry, David? I'm in my hospital, so this is the sound you get time to time. Uh, so, so we have really shown a, a, a great benefit uh, of PARP inhibitors. Uh, the first phase three trial uh, in maintenance setting or in any of the PARP phase three trial uh, was NOVA trial which was presented in 2016. Again, patients with platinum sensitive disease received four to six cycles of chemotherapy. And upon response, uh, we tested the germline BRCA status and patients were divided into two. So this trial has a very interesting statistical design. You have two parallel trials running, one in BRCA mute and one in non-G BRCA mute population. Uh, uh, so so the, if you look at the now look at this, uh, the efficacy in BRCA mute population. Again, you see a tremendous benefit and long-term benefit of giving maintenance neuroparib until progression of disease. When we look at the rest of the population, uh, you see again a hazard ratio of 0.45 uh, uh, with a long-term benefit of this. The question was, this is a very heterogeneous population. You have a lot of patients with HR deficient disease or HR proficient disease. How uh, is this benefit coming from HR deficient disease uh, uh, only? And we had a third primary endpoint, which was in this, in this uh, non-G BRCA population to check at the HRD positive only cohort. And again, you see a higher benefit at your hazard ratio of 0.38. So again, when we looked at the subgroup analysis of all this, we could show that the small proportion of somatic BRCA was doing as good as germline BRCA with hazard ratio of 0.27. And HR positive disease, which is sort of BRCA like, uh, uh, was uh, having a hazard rate of 0.38. But even the HR negative, HR proficient disease, HR in negative disease, have a very clinically highly beneficial uh, efficacy with hazard ratio of 0.58. And one fifth of the patients have not relapsed at the time of data cutoff. That made uh, European Medicines Agency and FDA to approve. Uh, um, the raparib uh, as maintenance, single agent maintenance therapy, uh, regardless of BRCA and regardless of HRD status. Uh, when we look at the patients who had only partial remission, they were doing as good as the rest of the population, both in G BRCA and non G BRCA population. Uh, the problem with neuroparib was that, that we started at the dose of 300 and we learned that that dose has to be uh, uh, to be corrected and I'll come back to that. When we looked, uh, when we had published this data, there was a letter to editor in New England Journal that probably the patients who were on active PARP inhibitor, they will not respond to chemotherapy as the placebo patients. And we did the analysis uh, and we showed that there is no difference. The patients who were in PARP, they will have the similar efficacy of platinum-based chemotherapy upon progression as the placebo patients. Uh, the third drug uh, here was rucaparib and also in whole population. And it showed again efficacy of rucaparib both in BRCA mute and BRCA wild type population. So this drug is also approved in a whole population regardless of BRCA and HRD status. When we look at the toxicity, most of the toxicity is uh, the, the class effect like fatigue, nausea, vomiting, uh, but, but niraparib has more neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Rucaparib has more uh, uh, LFT derangements, 
uh, and there is a little bit more hypertension in the rapari. But I think, again, the most important thing is how many patients drop the treatment due to toxicity, because this treatment is given not for two or three years as first line. Here you have given treatment until progression of disease. As you can see, 10 to 15% of the patients drop the treatment due to toxicity. Others continued. And patients themselves did not report that their quality of life uh, was worsened by giving uh, PARP inhibitor as compared to placebo. And this is from NOVA trial. You will see the same results from the other two trials I presented, SOLO2 and uh, with, with uh, uh, Arial 3. So, so now we have an option. If you look at the BRCA mute population, you have clear benefit of all PARP inhibitor in the trials. When you look at the BRCA wild type or non-G BRCA population, again, the data comes from NOVA trial, level one evidence, and from retrospective analysis of uh, study 19 uh, for Olaprib, and this is there is benefit. And, and on the right side, I have added also bevacizumab, and you have another option. So, so these are the, this has really uh, changed our way to, 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 to think how we are treating our patients and how we are actually treating our patients. As I said, that niraparib uh, start dose was, a, was not uh, uh, appropriate, 300 milligram in NOVA trial, and we retrospectively find out, found out that 77 kg or less uh, body weight you should start with 200 milligrams probably, uh, or if you have a thrombocyte count of 150 or less. So the Chinese trial, which was performed, which was presented last month at ESMO, um, used that uh, individualized dose and showed that efficacy was exactly the same with the hazard ratio in whole population of 0.32. And when you look at the BRCA mute and BRCA wild type or non-G BRCA population, again, hazard ratio of 0.22 and 0.40, extremely positive trial, um, but with much less toxicity. So all this has changed uh, the whole uh, scenario of ovarian cancer. These are the data from CS data from US showing that after introduction of PARP, prevalence of disease has increased by 33%. The 33% more patients are alive with the disease after introduction of PARP, which is extraordinary. And we are moving further because that's not enough. We are trying to combine it with uh, anti-angiogenic agents, with uh, immune therapy, with the triplets. And, and you can see on the right side, all these trials, we will see the data coming out very soon in Athena trial. Uh, these data will be coming out uh, in years to come where we will uh, see the benefit. So I've, I've come to the conclusion uh, that landscape of ovarian cancer management has changed dramatically and ovarian cancer uh, has changed to a chronic disease. And probably I believe that more patients are getting cured and not offering PARP inhibitor today is not an option. Uh, we are privileged to experience this unprecedented improvement uh, in outcome of our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansoor. That was very, very informative. So I think we belong to a society where we are not that uh, privileged to have access to these medications yet. We are just at Vivacizumab and we have not started using, I mean, we are just not even thinking of using it because it's not available. But uh, we have few questions. And one of the uh, questions is that, do, do you get BRCA testing done before uh, starting PARP inhibitors or in, in first line therapy, or you're offering it to all patients without this testing? So, so BRCA testing is a separate question. Uh, we do BRCA testing of all of our patients with ovarian cancer uh, upfront. When they come to my, our clinic after surgery or from, from uh, first thing we offer them is BRCA testing. Uh, it will not change our uh, way of deciding what three therapies we are going to give, but uh, we need family counseling uh, and we need uh, to tell them that if it is BRCA mute population, you probably have a higher uh, efficacy of PARP inhibitor. But BRCA testing is done in all uh, patients okay. uh, uh, because we need to do the family counseling. Okay, so not, it's not a requirement for starting the treatment? No. So another another question is uh, uh, it's it's regarding 
bevacizumab. So if there is a progression on VEGF, so would you switch to second like PARP inhibitors or uh, would you continue BEV along with PARP inhibitors? Oh, well, well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so, because the data from Avanova, the trial we presented last year at ASCO and this year overall survival shows that that bevacizumab plus niraparib was uh, significantly better as treatment in platinum sensitive disease as compared to niraparib alone. Uh, but this was a phase two randomized trial and we do not change our strategy according to the phase two data. Uh, we need phase three uh, uh, data to, to, to show that. Unfortunately, the trial done by NRG, uh, by Joyce Louis, uh, the phase three trial with sudoranib and, uh, and uh, olaparib had two caveats. First of all, there was a huge number of patients who were crossed over. So the patients who were uh, re had to receive no chemo, the only chemotherapy, they ended up receiving PARP. Uh, and, and second was the toxicity of sidronib. So we, would, we did not get that evidence from that trial either. So our strategy would be if patient was on bevacizumab has progressed, we will go back to chemotherapy and upon response, okay. then we will offer them PARP inhibitor. Okay. Normally it's out the other way around today because you start with PARP and upon progression, yeah. uh, you go on to chemotherapy plus concomitant BEV uh, okay. and maintenance. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you in our next meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, we don't have any questions, so I would like to move to the next speaker then. Thank you. And thanks again. Thank you very much. Time. So uh, I would like to introduce our next speak speaker, Dr. Uh, Nasir Ali. Dr. Nasir is a senior uh, clinical oncologist working at Aga Khan University Hospital. He's a lead for gynae oncology and his main interest is in cervical cancer, including radiotherapy and brachytherapy services. He's one of the key persons who has established brachytherapy services in Pakistan. So thank you very much, Dr. Nasir, for accepting our invitation. And I would uh, uh, like you to please start the presentation now. And I'm handing over the mic to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tavinda. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Mansoor, for your, uh, uh, you have timely completed your, <laughs> your talk. Uh, um, I was thinking that you will take some longer time as you intimated beforehand. So I'll should I share my screen, Dr. Tabinda? Sure. Please. Okay, Bismillah ibn um, Rahim. As Dr. Tabinda said that, um, she was kind enough to invite me uh, for this uh, talk. And I, I am actually the alumni of uh, uh, Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital. I learned my initial steps of brachytherapy from there. Then I uh, established brachytherapy when I was working in atomic energy. Then I joined Al Khan in 2006. And at that time, this machine was not in working condition. So we started these procedures in 2007 and now we have treated more than 200 patients and we are compiling the data. Some publications already have been done and some are in, on the way. So um, this is uh, my conflict of interest disclosure. Uh, this is highlight of uh, my uh, talk. I have divided uh, the my talk into two parts, evolution of external beam radiotherapy techniques and the evolution of brachytherapy techniques. Am I edible to everyone, Dr. Tavinda? Dr. Tavinda, can you hear me? Yes, we can see you, Dr. Nasir, and we can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, uh, external beam radiotherapy. And uh, if, we, if we think of our residency days and uh, uh, our days of initial training, uh, we used to read the uh, textbooks and it has been uh, in use four field box technique for treatment of the cervical cancer with radiotherapy. This has been in use for more than five decades. And people, radiation oncologists usually used to use the four field box techniques and for various disease stages, uh, we used to put different field sizes like APPA, 
between 15 by 15 centimeter and the lateral borders in the lateral films um, 8 by 15 centimeter. And the box technique, des technique described is using a conventional field size which varied according to the clinical stage of the disease. For example, 9 by 15 centimeter for the lateral films uh, that the posterior border of the lateral field used to be put at the interspace between S2 and S3. And, uh, but this type of radiation treatment planning uh, was unable to uh, include the other parameters like retroflexion of the uterus or associated pathology, which may significantly modify the normal anatomy. Um, and it was not considered while putting these four field box technique. And obviously, the cross sectional imaging and MR imaging was not uh, freely available in, in those days when these had been in, started in practice. You can see this one example that when the um, uh, posterior border in the lateral field is placed at the interspace between S2 and S3, you can see, um, let me put my laser, you can see that uh, this part of the cervix is get, getting no radiation in the lateral fields. So this can lead to a catastrophe in the treatment outcome of the patient. And for after putting the four field box technique, we used to block the normal tissues uh, with the help of blocks. And later on, when linear accelerators came into existence, then we used to put, uh, the, uh, we used to shape our radiation fields with the help of multi-leaf pollinators. And we, uh, many of us uh, must know must remember that to visualize the normal structures like small intestine, rectum, bladder, and anal canal, we used to use some radio contrast material, material like oral contrast was used to visualize the small gut, and the rectal contrast was used to visualize the rectum. And we used to put some general marker to see the what of the vagina. As well as if patient had locally advanced disease with periotic node, we used to uh, give uh, IV contrast at the time of uh, putting finalizing our radiation fields to see the kidney. So this was we have been practicing when we were in Shokat Khanum and these we learned from our teachers and uh, from books. And later on, when linear accelerators came into existence with the uh, multi-leaf pollinators, then we used to shape our radiation fields with the help of multi-leaf pollinators. And you can see that much of the small ball is being shielded with the use of um, this is the topographic anatomy uh, picture of the traditional anterior, posterior, and lateral fields, uh, anterior, posterior, and posterior anterior fields for the pelvis and the pelvis plus parahyotic region. And for the lateral fields, we used to shield the kidneys, which were uh, which which are lying in the paracolic gutters, or paravertebral gutters. And we have to shield the kidneys and the AP and lateral veins as well. So first time uh, in 1995, this study came. Uh, uh, this study was published in Red Journal, and they actually compared the conventional four field box technique, uh, and then they got a CT scan of these patients. You can see in this page in this uh, slide that uh, when we have put uh, the blocks in the lateral field and we have we have shielded part of the rectum in the lateral field and at the level of s or the femoral heads you can see the extent of disease in the ct scan transverse slice you can see that the cervical mass is extending uh, posteriorly and it is going parallel to the Rectum. And when we uh, will be treating these patients with the uh, uh, four field box technique and using to shield the uh, rectum, and you can well imagine that what will happen. Uh, this part of the disease, which was posterior to the rectum, that must have been shielded. So, this study was published for 36 patients, and they concluded that without knowledge of the precise tumor volume, the four field technique is potentially dangerous, risking underdosing of the tumor volume through the lateral pelvic portals. 
and this was actually the for the primary disease and as well as when we are treating the primary disease we have to take care of the lymph nodes this study was published in 1996 and uh, this was actually to see the coverage of the adequate coverage of the lymphatic regions to be treated so they compared four field box technique and then they did lymph angiography and then they said that uh, they concluded that bony lab ones are inaccurate for pelvic lymph nodal uh, coverage and the standard pelvic fields are not adequate to cover all the lateral external iliac lymph nodes so these studies actually these studies have um, alarmed the radiation oncology community that more uh, sophisticated uh, methods of treatment planning should be used now how our community of radiation oncologists moved from 2D to 3D trans, uh, treatment planning this was a study published in 1999 and they saw the uh, 3D treatment 3D conformal treatment planning for post operative rt in patients with node positive cervical cancer and they compared the plans of uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy with uh, 2D planning like 2D planning or conventional four field box technique and they concluded that mean tumor control probability values were almost equal in both uh, techniques but the mean volume of the small bowel receiving 95% or more of the prescribed dose was 47.47% for the four field box technique and it was only 15% in the uh, 3D conformal technique and at the same time the normal tissue mean normal tissue complication probability was decreased from 0.11 to 0.03 and the mean uh, uh, the near minimum dose to the uh, rectal sigmoid decreased from 48.4 gate to 30 gate when these patients were planned on conformal 3d planning as compared to the four field conventional box technique so this signifies that a more uh, focused radiation uh, treatment portals may uh, lead to less side effects uh, and a lot longer outcome this was another study published in uh, 2013 this was a population based study they actually saw the uh, survival five year survival of those patients who got treatment with 3d crt or imrt uh, 3d crt or 2d uh, box tech four field box technique five year survival was 86% for those patients who were treated on 3d and formal treatment and 78% for those who received treatment with four field box technique and at the same time the side effects were less when those patients were treated with 3d planning uh then uh, people uh, after getting this knowledge that uh, 3d is better than conform that conventional four field box technique uh radiation oncology community started thinking of more Uh, precise radiation fields so this was a study published in 2016 this was published from india they did dosimetric comparison between imrt and 3d conformal technique uh, in locally advanced cervical cancer patients they the actual prescribed dose d95 was better in the imrt group as compared to the 3d conformal treatment planning group and the homogeneity index was also better in the imrt group and at the same time the volume of bladder receiving 50 gray dose was 38% in the imrt group and 50% in the 3d crt group as well as the same uh, same was the case with rectum and the volume of small bowel receiving 45 gray dose was 132 cc in the imrt group and 227 cc in the 3d crt group so uh, this was the evidence that uh, imrt Uh, can help us to spare the normal tissues and in this way we can uh, prevent the side effects long term side effects so this 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 is the picture showing the dose coverage this is the uh, picture showing box uh, whole of box getting same dose everywhere and this is the imrt plan in this case you can see that small bowel as well as the part of the bladder and rectum can be spared with use of imrt So this was first time meta analysis published uh, for more than thousand patients, and they compared 
the three year survival and the toxicity for those patients who receive treatment on uh, IMRT versus 3DCRT. You can see that three year overall survival was better in favor of IMRT and three year disease free survival was also better in favor of IMRT. And at the same time, GI acute GI toxicity was also less in those patients who were treated on IMRT as compared to 3DCRT. So uh, you can see uh, that these are the pictures uh, showing uh, the isodose distribution for uh, IMRT plan versus 3DCRT plan. You can see that in 3DCRT plan, the small bowel is getting the same dose as our target volume is getting the dose. And uh, in this study, they uh, showed that the side effects were less uh, in the IMRT group as compared to the conformal group versus uh, conventional four, four field group. And they concluded that there is a high risk of geographical miss and dose limiting normal tissue toxicity when treating cervical cancer patients with conventional radiotherapy technique. But using these highly sophisticated techniques like IMRT, we, we should have uh, we should have alerted ourselves and that there are some risks associated with using highly conformal radiotherapy technique. This is, ex this is an example of one of my patients who is on treatment. You can see that this is a large cervical uh, tumor in this patient. And when we put this, she was being treated on a 3D CRT plan. And you can see that the rectum is much dilated and when the images were compared with the uh, cone beam CT, you can see that this area rectum has collapsed and our GTB is just touching the posterior border of the, our planned uh, PTB. So in this way, we can have, you can well imagine that this is, the GTB is there and in the cone beam CT, this was there. So we, uh, we, uh, or got this, got this patient uh, in the quarantine city on the first day. And then we had to replan it uh, after pro proper bowel preparation so that there should be minimum movement of the target volume. So my take home messages for the external beam radiotherapy are that highly conformal radiotherapy delivery techniques are better in terms of delivering adequate doses to the PTV at the same time, we can spare the OARs, and this leads to better disease-free and overall survival, along with less acute and long-term toxicity. But there are some risks associated with using highly conformal techniques, and we should be uh, very cautious about it. And we should train our um, physicists and our radiation pathologists and our RTTs. And there is an issue of moving target volume if we will keep our treatment volumes very tight, then the organ can move out of our treatment field. And uh, as you know, that the building of radiation oncology uh, specialty stands on uh, three pillars, namely radiation oncologists, clinical medical physicists, and the radiation therapy technologists. Uh, no matter how we uh, prevent, we shield the normal tissues by bit by bit by moving the uh, multi leaf polymeters uh, in our treatment plan. Uh, but if the art radiation therapy technologists, they are not well trained, uh, we, when we are doing planning, we have to plan the case for only one day and three, four, five hours. But the radiation therapy technologists, they have to handle the patient and they have to treat the patient for more than 25 days and we should be uh, uh, well aware that uh, as the radiation oncologists are important for treatment planning and the physicists are important for treatment planning the there is an equal importance of the radiation therapy technologists otherwise uh, by for sparing of the normal tissues by using mlcs will of will be of no use if the rts are not following our instructions and our treatment protocols. So at the time of treatment planning for these patients, we have to take care of the bowel preparation. The rectum should not be dilated much. 
and if the rectum is dilated in the first planning CT scan, we should uh, defer the treatment and we should uh, prepare the bowel and then we should replan the patient. And at the same time, we should supervise our RTTs by looking at the bone beam CTs uh, and support films so that there should be no geographical miss. Moving ahead, coming to the brachytherapy, uh, as you know, historically, external beam radiation therapy has been used uh, with four field box technique and after delivering certain dose of radiation to the whole pelvis, we used to put midline block. When we were in uh, early our residency in, in 99 and 2000, we had the practice to put in uh, midline block after 30 gray or 36 gray or even 40 gray, depending on the stage of the disease to spare the rectum and bladder from the uh, dose contribution, which will be coming with brachytherapy. But nowadays we have seldom used any midline block. And initially in the initial days, radium 226 was being used as a radioactive source for brachytherapy. Later on, CZ-137 low dose rate sources had been uh, in use for decades. And then the planning systems were there, the Manchester system. Initially, uh, we used to put the radiant sources on the season sources according to the uh, old method of uh, milligram radium, radium hours. You can see in this table. Then these are the guidelines uh, published in 1998 uh, from the Milling Crowd Institute of Immunology that for one A disease, whole pelvis is, was not advised to be treated and the whole of the dose was delivered with brachytherapy. But for slightly advanced stage disease, 2A, 2B, whole pelvis used to be treated with doses up to 20 to 30 gray, followed by midline block and then parametral boost followed by brachytherapy. And for advanced stage disease, up to 40 gray whole pelvis followed by midline block and then 20 gray to the parametral. But nowadays we have seldom used. I remember when we were in Shakat Khanam in our residency, we conducted a multinational trial. And in that, in that trial, that was actually the comparison of two chemotherapy regimes, cisplatin versus gemcitabine and cisplatin. And uh, in that trial, it was not mandatory to put midline block. From that trial, we gained a confidence that without, without adding midline block, we can uh, treat the patient with acceptable toxicity. So with the advent of uh, new gadgets like uh, SBRT and IMRD, and uh, because brachytherapy is not uh, available everywhere, people uh, actually not referring the patients for brachytherapy. So there was decline in the usage of brachytherapy. And this was an editorial published uh, in JCO in 2015 with the name that brachytherapy, where has it gone? Because people thought that there was a decline in the use of brachytherapy from 2004 to 2011. Uh, the decline in brachytherapy usage was uh, from 96 to 86 percent, whereas the use of modern techniques like IMRT and SBRT increased from 3.3 to 14 percent. But people think that instead of referring a patient to a center where brachytherapy is available, they, they thought that uh, external beam radiation therapy boost can be equally effective, but it is not true. Uh, you can see that the median survival was 70 months in those who received treatment with brachytherapy. And without brachytherapy, even though they received a boost with using IMRT or SBRT, the median survival was 47 months. You can see there is a huge difference in those patients who did not receive treatment with brachy. So this was a National Cancer Database Analysis, database analysis of radiation therapy consolidation modality for cervical cancer. And they evaluated the impact of new technological advancements. Uh, they actually dug out the factors which were associated with decreased utilization of brachy therapy. They, thought, they came up with the uh, factors that older age, people think that older age people cannot tolerate brachy therapy, so it is better to boost this GTV with external beam using IMRT, uh, likewise stage 4A disease, smaller tumor size, and later year of the diagnosis. Later year mean from the 2004 to 2011. In seven years, there was decline in the brachytherapy usage. And uh, uh, lower treatment volume centers and the facility types, there are uh, most centers do not have brachytherapy. So 
they tend not to refer the patient for brachytherapy treatment. Instead, they try to boost the GTV using external brain radiotherapy. You can see this graph that there was a decline in the usage of brachytherapy and there was uh, an increase in usage of uh, SBRT and IMRT. But this had, uh, you can see the difference in survival that in those patients who received treatment with brachytherapy, then survival was much better as compared to those who received external being boost with IMRT and more sophisticated technique. So they came up uh, with the conclusion that even when correcting for patients and facility characteristics, the use of an IMRT or SBRT boost was significantly associated with an increased uh, risk and mortality. So they said that brachytherapy should be part and parcel of treatment. So although brachytherapy is mandatory, uh, but there are some limitations of using two-dimensional brachytherapy treatment plan. There is limited ability to see the uh, actual tumor volume, and there is limited ability to see the organ at risk like the rectum, bladder, and sigmoid. And the point A placement, uh, we uh, everyone knows that uh, the point A is defined as the point two centimeters superior and two centimeters lateral to the lupus cervical canal from the external os. And there, the imaging sometimes they're not available, so there could be discrepancy uh, due to local failure or complications. Uh, this was a uh, retrospective review published from Netherlands. They compared survival in uh, the in those patients who were treated with uh, conventional brachytherapy versus uh, image guided brachytherapy. Overall survival at three years was 51 percent for those who received treatment on conventional brachytherapy versus 86 percent for those who received treatment on image guided brachytherapy. Likewise, pelvic recurrence was much higher in those patients who were treated on conventional brachy versus image guided brachytherapy. This is a very uh, interesting study. Uh, I'll take some time to explain it. They actually saw the, they correlated the traditional point A, which I have mentioned, uh, like the ICRU report that point A is defined as a point two centimeters superior to centimeter left to the cervical canal from the external loss. The purpose of this study was to assess the uh, compatibility of commonly used traditional point A and the actual anatomical point A. Actual anatomical point A is that where the uterine artery crosses the ureter. So what they did, what did they do? They, uh, in those patients, they selected those patients who had uh, lymph nodes in the pelvis and periaortic region. And then they do did uh, uh, laparoscopic lymphadenectomy. And uh, at the time of lymphadenectomy, they put uh, radio opaque markers at the uh, actual anatomical point A, where ureter crosses the uterus, uh, ureter, ureter, uterine artery. I'll show you the next picture. You can see that in this picture, uh, this is the ureter and this is the uterine artery. And they put a clip at the actual anatomical point where the uterine artery crosses the ureter. And then they put uh, uh, the uh, brachytherapy applicator, then they then they got uh, 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 orthogonal AP and lateral field for treatment planning. And uh, the results were very uh, interesting. That in 64 brachytherapy procedures, mean distance between traditional point A, like traditional point A, the two centimeters superior and two centimeters lateral to the external loss of the cervix. The mean distance between traditional point A and anatomical point A were 5.2 centimeter on the right side and 5.4 centimeter on the left side. So there was a huge difference in the dose. The estimated brachytherapy doses delivered to anatomical point A as a percentage of the presumed five gray fraction to the traditional point A was 35.2%. Means at anatomical point A, when we prescribe five gray dose to the traditional point A, the dose which was going at the anatomical point A was 35% less on the right side and 30% left less on the left side. So from this, uh, uh, Dr. Nasir, you uh, have five more minutes, please. Sure, sure. Um, I have only two slides. Uh, then they uh, did uh, um, the conclusion that traditional point A does not provide an accurate estimate of the anatomical point A. So then the era of uh, more image-based brachytherapy came. So the most remarkable work was done by JC Istro Working Group, and they published four in four 
papers in a series over the period of seven years. In the working group one recommendation, they said that uh, GTV should be defined uh, in two ways, the GTV at the time of diagnosis and GTV at the time of break performing brachytherapy. Likewise, the H, uh, CTV should be divided into two parts, two categories, HRCTV and the intermediate risk CTV. You can see that the thickness size of the disease uh, at the time of diagnosis and the time of brachytherapy procedure. So they said that uh, uh, in this uh, uh, working group uh, recommendations, they mentioned that uh, post external radiotherapy treatment volume should be considered for brachytherapy planning. Likewise, in uh, group working group two, they uh, mentioned the doses uh, to the organ at risk, and they said that uh, dose volume histogram should be used to evaluate the doses at OARs. This was very interesting uh, recommendation by the working group three, which was published. And then they said that there is some play, there is some uh, difference between the uh, the actual actual geometry of the uh, the brachytherapy applicator and the first developed position. So because of the 7.5 millimeter offset, there is significant dose decline at this point. So at that time, they said that uh, before accepting the applicators for treatment planning, uh, they should be uh, tested and they should be commissioned. And the in the working group four, they uh, emphasized that brachytherapy should be planned on, on MR and then, then they recommended the MR planes should be on the right angle and to the parallel uh, angles of the uh, cervix. So the, my take home messages are that conventional brachytherapy can lead to underdosing or overdosing of the volume of interest and image based brachytherapy requires dedication and well communicated teamwork and the GC uh, Jack Astro guidelines are taken as the standard guidelines for planning purpose. So this was my last slide. I will just put a cartoon here. You can see that there was a poor communication between the two teams and what happened. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Nasir. It was a wonderful talk. So uh, there's just a few couple of questions are there from the uh, participants. I'll take the questions one by one. So oh. one, uh, you, you've just said that while performing IMRT or rapid act planning in cervical cancer, there is a chance that you'll miss the target. So what is your take on adaptive radiotherapy in cervical cancer? And how do we, uh, are you moving towards ITV based therapy or it's a plan of the day sort of adaptive uh, therapy in cervical cancer? I think no. both of the experts can answer my question. <laughs> uh, first I'll, uh, I'll answer then I'll uh, request Dr. Mansoor to answer it if, 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 he, if he wants. Uh, that nowadays the era is of adaptive brachytherapy. The, 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 the aim of treatment should be less and less side effects. And it should be tried that adaptive brachytherapy and every day uh, being cone beam imaging or some sort of treatment verification should be done so that we can, we should not miss our target. Did I answer the question? Yep, I, I think yes, you did. But uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Mansoor, what, do, do you think we should move on to because in our setting, we cannot perform cone beam on daily basis. We tried that, but because of the workload, we couldn't manage that for a while. So do you think we should move to an ITV based volumes because, because I see a lot of internal motion in my cervical cancer patients? Oh, I, I believe yes, because we are doing cone beam. Uh, so that's, that's much easier for us. And we are following embrace protocol. Yep. So, so it's a completely different scenario we have, um, but in your setting, probably uh, uh, the best way to 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 keep the target in the field would be probably uh, going ITV based. Yes. So, okay. So we, we are also following embrace, but slightly modified embrace according to our yeah. <laughs> the uh, availability, I, because I, we have. I remember, yeah. remember Doctor, one patient in which at the start of treatment the uterus was retroflexed. And the, during the mid of treatment, when we assess yep. the patient, you know, anti flexed. Yeah, yeah. All of our all of our uh, uh, all of our machines have uh, cone uh, cone beam. Yep. So it's uh, it's uh, we have fourteen machines, and all are using cone beam. So, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a different scenario. I'm sorry, we are in a luxury situation, as 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 you said. It's it's not. So, a, yeah. So we we uh, Dr. Mansur, there's another question that. It, 
when we are performing MRI based brachy, that, that means uh, we cannot perform MRI on each and every fraction because of the same limitations. But we have got the slots for uh, first fraction that like at least the first fraction we are delivering with MRI. Do you think it will help us in fusing the first MRI that we have performed with later on because the position is changing so rapidly in between brachy that I thought that this might not be of help to us. Uh, that's difficult. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're following embrace, you're also we filling, are, we bladder, are, yeah. filling the bladder and trying yeah. to keep that. Uh, and if you're just doing an MRI in the first, that's 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 probably not going to help you that much yeah. because because if you have the movement set the later on, how you are going to control that, um, that would be very difficult. Yeah. So. And what about your experience about SIP stereotactic, uh, I mean, simultaneous integrity boost in involved nodes? Like, are you seeing more toxicity in these patients or? Uh, no, we are not. We are giving simultaneous boost, uh, 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 but we, we are not seeing that uh, uh, toxicity uh, in these patients. Okay. No, no, um, that's not the case. And on top of that, what we are doing is uh, if we have to go up and take the periodic nodes, we are all doing two plannings at the uh, treatment plannings at the same time. We are also planning for the proton therapy and see if which of the treatment would be best. It's the proton okay. or proton. Uh, uh, so, but very few patients are receiving proton the periodic. Uh, yeah, for the periodics. Um, otherwise, no. So one of the participants has asked about uh, in case brachytherapy is not possible because of technical reasons, not because of the availability, because of the tumor anatomy or something. So will you consider external beam radiotherapy boost? And if yes, to what dose can you take that? We we then we we in that case we plan Muppet. Uh, okay. uh, uh, we 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 try our best to add brachytherapy. You yeah. you cannot. Uh, it's it's the very last and not the best option to to to, to go for uh, external. Uh, I don't know what is your experience, uh, Dr. Nasser. Uh, we try if we cannot do it with conventional. We do the Muppet. We do. We have other uh, upper, uh, techniques available, but we try to do as much as possible practice. Yes, and you it will right. be special. Yes, you are right, Dr. Nasser. Whenever, whenever we. Committed brachytherapy, we had to regret afterwards that yes. without brachytherapy, we cannot give that much dose. One day I was planning a patient and I saw that the uh, actual substance of the cervix was getting 150 gray dose of radiation. Mm -hmm. And this has helped, this has made it possible to get cure of this disease without surgery. Exactly. Otherwise, you cannot give 150 gray dose of with external beam radiation. So, Dr. So, Mansur, when are we getting the embrace results out? Oh, um, that will take some time. Okay. I believe I believe in 22, maybe in 21, maybe some some of the results. It depends which part of embrace we are talking about. Okay. But but <laughs> but yes. Okay, so there but are we no will, more. We will have yeah. outback trial results next year, so I think we will get some interesting results coming in in the, in okay. the near future. So some role of chemotherapy would be explored in, and we, sh we should have the results soon. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank you both, Dr. Nasir, Dr. Mansoor. Thank you very much for taking out time uh, from your busy schedule and especially with the time difference that we have. And in this difficult times when we don't know whether Trump is going to be there or Biden is going to be there. Well, it seems <laughs> that uh, Biden will win because he just got Georgia lead as well. So, so it looks like, yeah, but yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful session. Let's Thank hope that we'll see you next year in person. Thank absolutely. you so much. If it is possible, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks for inviting. Thank you.